Welcome back to Amerisogyny. I'm your host, Hannah Blue. You're listening to episode 30. Who's going to check Kim Jong-un? If you've read about the Holocaust, you know people were forced to hide from the Nazis. Some starved to death in seclusion. Others starved to death in Nazi concentration camps. In all, the Holocaust killed over 6 million Jews. Now we tell ourselves that this moment in time was so atrocious, it could never happen again. No government should ever have the power to make people suffer. But we know there are people suffering due to their government, and I don't feel it's getting enough attention. I want you to picture yourself in a country where you, your family, your neighbors are starving to death and your government does nothing to help you. In fact, if you're caught trying to make a living, trying to feed your family, you could go to prison. You could die. Ridiculous, right? Hmm. It's happening. Today, we're making one stop. North Korea. North Korea's people are dying from starvation and lack of health care. Its leader, Kim Jong-un, doesn't give a damn. In the 1990s, North Korea had a famine that killed nearly 3 million people. The pandemic that hit just three years ago helped no one except big corporations. The world is still living with the ramifications of the pandemic, but especially North Korea. When Kim Jong-un sealed North Korea's borders, he cut off food and medicine. These are things people need to survive. How many trips do you take to the grocery store a week? What medications are you on? What if your freedom to buy food and get medicine stopped? What would you do? There are women and children who are literally dying in North Korea. But his focus is not to help his people. It's punishment, incarceration, execution, and it's sex. North Korea has a cruel, disgusting tyrant who does not care about dead kids. I slept very poorly last night. I woke up, got my coffee, and said, it's raining. I'm taking it easy today. But when I turned on my computer and saw BBC broke the story, I read it. And I said, this has to be episode 30. More people need to turn full attention to North Korea. So, as exhausted as I am today, I'm broadcasting this story on my podcast. We live in a very cruel world, a selfish world, where some people only care about themselves. Well, I'm going to shine a spotlight on regular people, and I feel they should be given the same level of admiration and respect as some give the rich. Why? Because they're suffering. Another reason the suffering of North Koreans should be your business, Kim Jong-un and his sister have threatened us, the U.S. President Biden is working with South Korea's President Yoon against Kim Jong-un's antics. People say Biden is too old to lead this country, but I'm voting for him in 2024. For one, He's not afraid of North Korea. So when they issued their threat, he held a press conference with Yoon and said, Look, a nuclear attack by North Korea against the U.S. or its allies or partners is unacceptable and will result in the end of whatever regime to take such an action. I'm with Biden. If Kim Jong-un had his way, we would be living like his people starving, unable to make a living. What have we become if we only care about the countries that provide pop stars? Hmm? Is that right? No. Our favorite K-pop, J-pop, and C-pop stars were once kids. Had they starved to death, we wouldn't be enjoying their music, going to their concerts, buying their merchandise. I paid a little over $20 for RM's album, Indigo. That's about 18,900 North Korean won. 
It's not much, but it could feed somebody. These pop stars wouldn't have been able to, as some fans say, save them. My question is, who will save the children of North Korea? Too many bad things are going on over there. People are committing suicide. They're attacking police. We need to care. So let's get started. By sharing secrets with the BBC, some North Koreans have risked their lives to share what life is like there since the government sealed their borders over three years ago. They are starving with no chance to escape. In addition, new bizarre laws have been passed to keep them in line. Their names were changed out of necessity to protect them. Their comments are scary. I am living on the front line of life. The state tells us we are nestling in our mother's bosom, but what kind of mother would execute their child in broad daylight? And we are stuck waiting to die. Being enlightened on how they're living reminded me of the movie The Village and Lois Lowry's The Giver, where decisions were made by one group of people and the rest were robbed of choices. Everything around them was manipulated, and the life they led was all they knew. Kim Jong-un has isolated his people from the outside world. He controls everything. He's not a giver. He's a taker. A taker of freedom. A taker of hope and dreams. A taker of nourishment and health. Before the pandemic, Mayan Suk was a successful businesswoman. She sold medication. Now she sells smuggled medication in secret, only a small amount to survive day by day. She was caught smuggling medication before and had to pay a bribe to stay out of prison. She can't afford to be caught again, but at any time, the police or her neighbors could rat her out. The pandemic hit, and on January 27, 2020, North Korea closed its border. This stopped anyone and anything, including food and medicine, from entering the country. No one was allowed to leave, and everyone was on lockdown. Aid workers and diplomats left, and guards were ordered to shoot anyone who approached the border. Kim Jong-un forbids North Koreans from contacting the outside world. But three people have defied him and shared what they know with BBC. They know if the government found out what they did, they could be killed. But they're desperate. What they've shared is only a tiny picture of what's going on because if too much information was leaked, their identities will be compromised. What they've shared is so horrific. To know that things are ten times worse is heartbreaking. My unsuck says our food situation has never been this bad. Most women in North Korea are the main breadwinners because the men don't earn enough to live on. Before they closed the border, Mayan Suk arranged for drugs, such as antibiotics, to be smuggled in from China, and she would sell them at the market. Even then, she had to bribe the guards, which cut her profit in half, but she lived better than she's living now. She didn't have to worry about food or medication. Feeding her family was always stressful. But now, she's desperate. Closing the border made it almost impossible to obtain the products she needs to sell. Being caught trying to smuggle the medicine after the pandemic hit, she is now under surveillance. Selling North Korean medicine doesn't work either because that's hard to get to. She no longer feeds her family rice. They eat corn. Her neighbors are so hungry. They come to her to eat. But she has to turn them down. She doesn't have enough to feed them too. She says, we are living on the front line of life. As I said, these people are risking their lives to tell you their stories. There are many Anne Franks living right in North Korea. Their government is exterminating them by withholding food and medicine. For the naysayers who say, well... Your country has its problems too. Yes, it does. Women in the U.S. suffered a blow when the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. That doesn't mean women have given up fighting for the right to make decisions about our bodies. 
and we can do that. We're allowed to oppose our government without the threat of being starved or murdered. In North Korea, if you challenge Kim Jong-un, guess what? You're dead. I can't imagine being penalized for trying to make a living. I can't imagine starving and having no access to food. And I can't imagine Biden, our president, controlling everything we do and restricting the outside world to us. The music we listen to, the imports we rely on. So, while the U.S. may not be perfect, we do have more freedom in this country than in North Korea. I can't stand people who say, if you don't like America, leave. Some have left. Wealthy people have figured out it's cheaper to live abroad than in the U.S. at the expense of locals. There's a war on in the trans community. So some have left because they do not have the freedom to be who they are in this country. They've been forced out, and it's a shame. Imagine being in a country where you can't leave. That's North Korea. The people are trapped there. Let's hear from Chan Ho. Chan Ho is a construction worker, and he says, I want people to know that I'm regretting being born in this country. He's a good husband. He helps his wife carry her products. Then he goes to his job, but says her business is the only reason he's alive. He only makes 4,000 won a day. That's 50 cents. That's not enough to buy a kilo of rice. And the government doesn't give them food rations. He says the food markets are almost empty. And the price of rice, corn, and seasonings have skyrocketed. Imports are vital because North Korea does not produce enough food to feed its people. Sealing the border was a huge mistake. They don't have enough food nor fertilizer and machines to grow crops. Chan Ho says when they closed the border, everything became scarce. At first, Chan Ho feared COVID killing him, but after people started dying around him, he worried about starving to death. The first family in his village to die from starvation was a mother and her children. She'd become too sick to work. Her children kept her alive by begging for food, but they all died. Next, a mother violated quarantine rules and was sentenced to hard labor. She and her son starved to death. And a friend's son was released from the military because he was malnourished. His face began to bloat, and within a week, he died. Chan Ho says, I can't sleep when I think about my children having to live forever in this hopeless hell. Ji Yan lives hundreds of miles away from Chan Ho, but shares the same experience. She struggles to support her family with meager earnings working in a food shop. She used to sneak fruit and vegetables out of the shop to sell at the market, along with cigarettes her husband received in bribes from his co-workers. She could buy rice. Now her bags are searched before she leaves, and there are no more bribes. People can't afford to give anything anymore. She says they've made it impossible to have a side hustle. Ji Yan now pretends she has three meals a day, but eats only one. She thinks hunger is better than people knowing she's poor. According to her, she had to eat poljuk for a week. That's a mash of vegetables, plants, and grass, ground into an oatmeal-like paste. They ate this in the 90s when the famine hit. It's 2023, and North Koreans are being forced to eat poljuk again. Think about the depression we had in the U.S. Some people made water pies. Yeah, you heard me. Water pies. Can you imagine going back to that? I can go to my fridge and eat whatever I want. Shrimp, fruit, a fried bologna sandwich if I want. You and I, like most people in the U.S., have the choice to eat. North Koreans don't in 2023. Let me say what the people of North Korea don't have the freedom to say. Kim Jong-un and his family needs to be forced out of power. He needs to be arrested and left to rot in the deepest, darkest hole. Those borders need to be reopened, 
so that its people have access to food and medicine so they can have jobs again to support their families. That's how it should be all over the world. Over there, this podcast would never exist. For what I'm saying, I'd be arrested and thrown into prison. Possibly executed. Now back to Ji Hyun. She says, I know one family that starved to death at home. We survived by thinking 10 days ahead, then another 10, thinking that if my husband and I starve, at least we will feed our kids. She said she went two days without food. I thought I was going to die in my sleep and not wake up in the morning. Now she's a true Samaritan. She's had it hard, but she cares about those who have it harder. She checks on beggars she finds lying down, and sometimes they're dead. One day she knocked on her neighbor's door to give them water, but they didn't answer. Three days later, authorities found the entire family had starved to death. It's a disaster, she says. With no supplies coming from the border, people don't know how to make a living. She's heard of people committing suicide at home and others going into the mountains to die. She notes the bleak mentality that affects the city. This podcast is all about mental health. I find the mental health angle in every story I bring to you. Now, you know Kim Jong-un doesn't believe in psychology and psychiatry. Think of the state of their mental health. They are watching their children die. And there's nothing they can do about it. If that happened here, we would impeach Biden so fast. There's no way we'd sit here and watch our kids die of starvation. But we have the freedom to call for impeachment. North Koreans don't. Ji Yeon says, even if people die next door, you only think about yourself. It's heartless. It reminds me of a book, Night, Dawn, and Day. This is why reading is important. This is why we can't allow books to be banned in the U.S. This book does an amazing job highlighting the catastrophic effects of hunger while being imprisoned in concentration camps. And I'm sure some ignorant ass out there will say, well, you can't compare the two. I can't. Tell me, what race does hunger belong to? What culture does it affect the most? Hunger belongs to no specific group. It affects everyone. Just as mental health affects everyone across the globe. So yeah, I can compare Germany and North Korea. I certainly can. In the U.S., we love our carbs. We love our chipotle with rice. We love bread, sandwiches, and pitas. But in North Korea, the price of flour is about 18,000 won. It's so expensive, only the very wealthy eat white rice and sweetened rice cakes as a treat. Most North Koreans survive on corn and other coarse grains. Would you believe flour costs more than rice? Here's what's sad. For North Koreans, bread or jijim pancakes are only for the rich. An anonymous source says only the rich can buy imported flour and eat bread. Before COVID, people bought cheap Russian and Chinese flour. Now they can't get it due to the border being closed. The price of rice is about 6,600 won, which in the U.S. is $7.33. Now I remember eggs being that price and higher and people stopped buying them. It would be that way for flour as well. In fact, I can remember when flour was a little over a dollar. It's gone up since the pandemic, but nowhere near $7. According to the source, flour had been a cheap ingredient to make snacks and fried dishes. Now, ordinary people can't even dare to buy flour. When the price of flour is more than two or three times that of rice, bread and mandu dumplings becomes food that only the wealthy can afford. I can't imagine a sack of flour being compared to Kobe beef or Japan's Miyazaki mangoes. I can't imagine. The fear North Korea could face another famine is very real. According to Peter Ward, who studies North Korea, it's all well and good to say you've heard about people starving to death. 
But when you actually know people in your immediate vicinity who are starving, this implies the food situation is very serious, more serious than we realized, and worse than it's been since the famine in the late 90s. In the 90s, people were allowed to leave the country and relocate it to South Korea, Europe, and the U.S. Now, Kim Jong-un is having none of that. No one is allowed to live. Myon Suk believes the government used the pandemic as an excuse to cripple its people by exerting full control over their lives. She says, really, they want to crack down on the smuggling and stop people from escaping. Now, even if you just approach the river to China, you'll be given a harsh punishment. According to Chan Ho, the famine was difficult in the 90s, but the harsh crackdowns and punishments didn't exist. He says, if people wanted to escape, the state couldn't do much. Now, one wrong step and you're facing execution. His friend's son witnessed several executions carried out by the state. Each time, three to four people were killed for trying to escape. If I live by the rules, I'll probably starve to death. But just by trying to survive, I fear I could be arrested, branded a traitor, and killed, Chen Ho says. We are stuck here, waiting to die. Kim Jong-un also hates South Korea. He doesn't want his people to be influenced by the freedom South Koreans have. Before the border closed, more than a thousand people escaped and arrived in South Korea annually. Now, only a handful have fled and made it safely to the South. Remember how disgusting it was that Trump wanted to build a wall to keep foreigners out? Well, for three years, North Korean authorities built multiple walls, fences, and guard posts to fortify the border. Now, it's almost impossible to flee. Satellite images picked up two walls and a lot of guard posts. It's dangerous to even try to contact people outside of North Korea, too. In the past, people could make secret phone calls abroad with smuggled Chinese phones. Now, Chan Ho says anyone with a Chinese phone is ordered to turn themselves in. Mayan Suk's friend was caught talking to someone in China and was sentenced to prison for several years. Hannah Song is from the North Korean Database Center for Human Rights. She says, By cracking down on smuggling and people's connections to the outside world, the state is stripping its citizens of their ability to fend for themselves. At a time when food is already scarce, it is fully aware of the damage this will cause. Now that didn't keep COVID-19 out. They had no way to test people but they locked down entire towns and streets for more than two weeks. For Ji Yan's neighbors, who didn't have enough food to last the lockdown, vegetables were placed outside their door every other day. But people who lived along the border received no help. This caused Mayan Suk to panic. It also caused her to secretly sell medicine. Chan Ho says five families were half dead by the time they were released from lockdown, they survived by sneaking out to find food after dark. Those straight-laced people who stayed at home could not survive, he says. People were clamoring, saying they were going to starve. And for a few days, the government released some emergency rice from its stockpiles. Some reports state in some areas, lockdowns were called off early when it became clear people wouldn't survive. Those who caught the virus couldn't depend on their country's decrepit hospitals for treatment. Even basic medicine ran out. The government advised people to use folk remedies. When Ji Yan got sick, her friends recommended she drink hot water infused with green onion roots. I have green onions in my fridge right now. When I'm hungry, I eat them. But when I'm sick, I make an appointment to see my doctor. North Koreans don't have that choice. I know I keep saying this, but that's how dire some things are over there. According to Ji Yian, many elderly and children have died from COVID-19. In August 2022, the government claimed COVID-19 was over, yet many quarantine measures and rules are still in place. When Kim Jong-un sealed the border in such an extreme manner, he surprised the international community. 
North Korea is heavily sanctioned because they're obsessed with nuclear weapons. It's banned from selling its resources abroad and unable to import the fuel it needs to function. North Korea was already in economic ruin, so he did no favors to his people by closing the border. He only made things worse. North Korea also has one of the worst health care systems in the world, along with a starving and unvaccinated population. Hannah Sung and Myun Suk had the same conclusion, and I think it's spot on. COVID presented Kim Jong-un with the perfect opportunity to control his people. Hannah says this is what he has secretly wanted to do for a really long time. His priority has always been to isolate and control his people as much as possible. Control. That's the bottom line. He thrives on control. My young suck loves K-dramas. Me too, girl. Kim Jong-un doesn't want North Koreans to watch South Korean dramas. They're forbidden. No rugal. No healer. I recently watched the K2 in The Sound of Magic with Ji Chang Wook. Oh my god. That man is beautiful. I really don't like musicals, but he's so gorgeous. I watched all six episodes, okay? And in the K2, he had a naked fight scene. They blurred his manly parts, but ooh, he was still impressive. Not being able to watch him is indeed a crime. The king, eternal monarch with Lee Min Ho, made me sign up for Netflix. I've watched all 16 episodes multiple times and I will continue watching it because he's another one that's just so fine. South Korea has some gorgeous men. I'm with the people for smuggling K-dramas into North Korea and secretly selling them. Myeon Suk says she saw one about a K-pop star who showed up at his family's house claiming to be their long-lost son. I haven't seen that one. Last night I watched a movie. I think it was called Night in Paradise. I did not like how that one ended. I was on dude's side and the girl's. And I'm glad she took care of business. But I didn't want either of them to have the ending they had. I wanted them to end up together. I know I'm going off topic a bit, but I'm trying to lighten the mood due to the subject matter I'm discussing is pretty heavy. I think North Korea, if they are liberated from their tyrant, could be just as good as South Korea if given a chance. He is consistently passing stupid laws like the Reactionary Ideology and Culture Rejection Act. This was passed in December 2020. Under this law, if you smuggle foreign videos into the country and pass them out, you can be executed. Chan Ho calls this the scariest new law of all. Just watching the videos can lead to 10 years in prison. The pitiful excuse for this law is to prevent the spread of a rotten ideology that depraves our society. <laughs> what can be worse than withholding food and medicine from people and allowing them to die? Kim Jong-un feels his people learning about the prosperous and free world that exists outside its borders and waking up to the lies they are being sold. Chan Ho says since the law was passed, foreign videos have almost disappeared. But Gen Z North Koreans stand in defiance. Oh, they watch them. And their parents worry. I say, go Gen Z. But their parents are justified in worrying. Ji Yeon says at a trial, a 22-year-old man received 10 years and 3 months in a hard labor camp just for sharing South Korean songs and films. Before 2020, she says he would have received just one year in prison. People were shocked how much harsher the punishment was. It's so scary the way they're targeting young people. Of course they're coming for Gen Z. Their government is using intimidation to ensure their loyalty. It's fully aware they grew up with different mindsets from their parents. Their parents grew up receiving gifts from the state. Kim Jong-un gives his people nothing. 
He's assigned teams to crack down on anything deemed anti-socialist. People don't trust each other and fear is heavy. That's precisely what he wants. Ji Yan was interrogated under the new law. Now, she doesn't speak out to her fellow citizens. It's a very effective tactic. According to Professor Andre Longkov, who studied North Korea for 40 years, if people don't trust each other, there is no starting point for resistance. North Korea can stabilize and last for years and decades to come. Now that's true. In order to overthrow a government, you have to be in agreement. Isn't that what conservatives did on January 6th? But I digress. If the citizens of North Korea tried to overthrow their government, I would be in full support of them. Kim Jong-un is a tyrant. He doesn't deserve to be their leader. We have democracy in the U.S. We have freedom of speech here. North Korea does not. In January 2023, the government passed another law. This time, banning people from using words with South Korean dialect. Breaking this law can result in execution. Let me repeat that. North Koreans can be killed for using South Korean pickled language. Disgusting. Ji Yan says there are too many laws to remember and people are being taken away without knowing which ones they allegedly violated. When they ask, prosecutors tell them, you don't need to know which law you broken. Wow. There's a small light at the end of the tunnel. The authorities might reopen the border. They're allowing China to send grain and flour over the border, maybe to minimize lack and stave off a much feared famine. But according to Chad O'Carroll, even if North Korea finally decides to reopen, it's unlikely the people's old freedoms will be returned. He runs the North Korean monitoring platform, NK Pro. He says, The systems of control that have emerged during the pandemic are likely to cement. This will make it harder for us to understand the country. And sadly, much harder for North Koreans to understand what is happening outside of what they're told. Chan Ho says people are so focused on finding one meal a day, simply happy to have food, they don't think about the changing system. But here's how resilient the people of North Korea are. They're forced to attend weekly life review sessions where they admit to mistakes and failures and report on their neighbors. The sessions are designed to encourage good behavior and root out people who disagree with the government. Sounds like mind control and manipulation to me. They're aware they can't admit this in the classes. But Chan Ho says people have stopped believing the propaganda on TV. He says the state tells us we are nestling in our mother's bosom. But what kind of mother would execute their child in broad daylight for running to China because they were starving? Mayan Suk says before COVID, People viewed Kim Jong-un positively, but now almost everyone is full of discontent. Ji Yan remembers when Kim Jong-un met with former President Trump in 2018 to negotiate giving up his nuclear weapons. She recalls being filled with hope and laughter, thinking she might soon be able to travel to foreign countries. Then the talks broke down, and since then, Kim Jong-un has continued to spend his limited finances on improving nuclear arsenals. We were tricked, says Ji Yian. The border closure has taken our lives back 20 years. We feel hugely betrayed. The people never wanted this endless weapons development that brings hardship to generation after generation. Chan Ho blames the U.S. and the U.N. He says the U.S. and the U.N. seem half-witted and wonders why they still offer to negotiate with Kim Jong-un when clearly he's not going to give up his weapons. Instead, Chan Ho wishes the U.S. would attack his country. Only with the war and by getting rid of the entire leadership can we survive, he says. Let's end this one way or another. Mayan Suk agrees. If there was a war... People would turn their backs on our government, she says. That's the reality. 
but Ji Yian hopes for something simpler. She wants to live where people aren't starving, where they don't have to spy on each other, and she wants to eat three meals of rice a day. In the last time she spoke with BBC, she reported she didn't have enough to feed her child. I would like for North Korea to be free as well. And right now, the U.S. is focused on Ukraine. If the U.S. went to war with North Korea, which I truly think is coming because Kim Jong-un isn't going to stop his bullshit, then Americans will suffer too. But if we're going to put all of this effort in for Ukraine, why not do it for North Korea as well? Isn't that why the U.S. intervened in World War II when Hitler invaded Poland to liberate the Jews from Hitler's madness? I'm not a history expert, but I know Hitler needed to be stopped. And I view Kim Jong-un along the same lines as Hitler. Some feel our military isn't strong enough to support two foreign countries. Some feel Biden needs to focus on the American people more. And some say, Going to war with North Korea would hurt Biden's chances at a second term in office. All are valid points. But I say, how long do we allow people to suffer? And why? Because they don't look like us? They don't share our culture? Does that make it justifiable? I think a huge stain on our government is the Clinton administration failing to intervene sooner in the Rwandan genocide in 1994. Over 300,000 lives could have been saved. The U.S. loves to project it is the greatest nation in the world, but we can only be great by showing compassion and giving support to ones who need it the most. And I'm out of time. If this story resonated with you on any level, feel free to follow me on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Samsung, or wherever you listen from. I will be back with more stories. And thank you for listening to episode 30. Can you believe we've reached 30 episodes? Be easy. Take care of yourselves. Have a good weekend. And as always, God.